今天的 keynote 是啊、uh, ，David Eves。那啊， uh, 其实刚才各位打招呼，这个这个这一招是跟他学的啦。So I learned this trick from David Eves, like having everyone greeting to each other next to you. 那他是呃， uh, 这个在 Open Data Open Government 呃、uh, ，非常非常呃， uh, 先呃， uh, 就说非常前前卫，非常前前就 leading thinker 在在这个领域上面非常非常前卫的一个。呃，实实行者跟呃，这个这个领域的专家，好，那所以呃，我们就呃，直接来欢迎他 ，David Eves。Looking good. We are looking good. Good morning, everybody. It's morning for you. I have no idea what time it is for me,、um, <laughs> other than I'm in a very good mood.、Um, I can't thank you enough for inviting me to come here.、Uh, it's a huge privilege.、Um, I and I and I also know that that CL has actually way overdone any introduction of me to make me sound much much better than I actually am.、Um, so I can only hope that I can live up to the expectations that. He has set、um, and、uh, and kind of talked to you about some of the things that I think are really important, especially for a group that's here. And in fact, I'm really excited because of all the work that you guys done to talk about ways that I think you can become more effective than you've even been.、Um, before I go any further, I just want to acknowledge the translator up in the booth there. And、uh, she, we had dinner last night together. She should just pound the glass if I start to get too excited and talk really, really quickly, which occasionally happens.、Um, so. Are these working at all? Oh, I can't roam.、Uh, Let me know. Which should I try another one? We'll do microphone roulette. This one? No.、Nope. This one. I'll let you.、Uh... There we go.、Uh, no. Oh, there we go. Perfect.、Um, so this is me.、Uh, maybe just really quickly.、Uh, everything's kind of gone pear-shaped on us here.、Um, so this is.、Uh, This is like a Venn diagram of who I am and what I do. So I really split my time thinking about open data and government.、Um, I spend、uh, another part of my life actually working as a negotiation expert, advising people、um, on how to make parties that don't necessarily agree come together.、Um, and I kind of fuse all those three things together. If you want to see what that looks like,、um, these are the organizations that I have done work with、um, currently or in the past.、Um, the only purpose of this slide is to make you think that I am smart and have other interesting smart people listen to me. So we should move on as quickly as possible from it.、Um, way back, and it's funny to say this, but way back in 2009,、um, I was advising the mayor of Vancouver,、uh, and we were thinking about, you know, what do we do around technology? And I had suggested, along with a colleague, that we should do open data. And at the time, only the city of Washington D.C. had done it, and so Vancouver became the second city in the world to have an open data portal. And it kind of launched me into this world of thinking more and more about what, what how open data works. And now I kind of take an even more expansive view about how information in government works. And so. I kind of want to share what I think is a relevant story for the people in this room because I think、um, I have a history undergrad. I'm always very interested in what the history can teach us about where we're going and what we can be doing.、Um, and you guys have a lot that you can be congratulated in the recent history that I think is, is completely amazing. So、um, I look at the projects you guys have engaged in, like the Real Price Project,、um, the Ministry of、uh, Education Dictionary,、uh, the Job Helper,、um, Congress Matters. Uh, especially the dictionary project. The dictionary project completely blows my mind in its awesomeness.、Um, yes, whoever just said "woo," you should say it louder because everybody in the room should be excited about what you do. I've never seen a project like this anywhere in the world,、um, and to have the kind of success it's had. So you guys have had real successes,、um, and I think you've also had your own struggles. And the question is, is how do you build on these successes?、Um, you. You are one of the, I would believe, one of the more successful groups in the world in trying to figure out ways to hack your government and make them think differently. So let's go further back, though. Let's look at, at you know, kind of this space in a much deeper level. And I always like to look at the history of the Freedom of Information Act,、um, which is legislation in many countries which allows you to access government information. And if we look at the history of the Freedom of Information Act, the first one was passed in 1766 in Sweden, and that's a little bit of an outlier. Um, so you kind of have to skip several centuries、uh, before you get to the next one, which is in 1966, which is in the United States.、Um, 
And it passes. It's actually a quite a weak act. It doesn't have the kind of strength that you associate um, with access and information rules today. Uh, and then if you go a little further, you come here, you see there's a bunch more acts that get passed in the 70s. In the 80s, there's a few more acts. And then in the 90s, the 2000s, there's a few more still. And if you look at this history, you kind of go to yourself, that's really interesting. Um, look at all of these things that happened. And you ask yourself, well, why? Why did it happen? And um, this is a really important question. Well, why, starting in the 1970s, did you suddenly start to have Access to Information Acts, Freedom of Information Acts? And I think the kind of mythology around this is that initially this guy did something. Uh, this is a representative in the House of Representatives in the United States. Um, he became very concerned with how much money was being spent on defense contracts and wanted access to budget information. And so he lobbied to have an Access to Information Act so that people could understand how much money was actually being spent on defense. Um, and that kind of explains the 1966 Act. Um, but then, um, things really kind of become more aggressive in 1974 when that act gets real teeth. And I think the, the, the legend around this is that we really have this guy here to thank. This guy here. So um, Richard Nixon did not pass this act, to be clear. Um, Richard Nixon was the man who, of course, was caught with his hand in the cookie jar that mobilized people to want to pass an Access Information Act. Um, for those who don't know Richard Nixon, this might be an image that's more familiar to this generation of people. Um, and, and I think the mythology is that what you had was a, a kind of a coalition of the public, of progressive people who came together in response to Richard Nixon and what he had done and said, this must never happen again. We must pass some act that guarantees more transparency. Um, and as a result, you know, even those who were opposed kind of ended up being in favor of it and it got passed. And my response to all that is I actually think this item is actually equally responsible for the creation of the Access Information Act and the Freedom of Information Acts. Because there's a parallel history that now happens. Um, when you look at that act, you have to ask yourself, why was it Richard Nixon that created the political scandal that created this act? Um, it wasn't like there had never been a political scandal in the United States before Richard Nixon. There had definitely been corrupt politicians. So why was it at that moment? And I think this history is actually quite revealing. That when you look in 1960, the Xerox 914, which is the first real Xerox copier, gets released to the public. And it is a huge event. You have to understand, Fortune magazine calls the launch of this product the single most successful launch of a commercial product in the history of America. To go further, between 1960, uh, sorry, between 1950 and 1959, the entire revenue of the entire decade, all of the revenues that Xerox generated was $12 million. That's in an entire decade's worth of revenue. And yet, by 1968, they were doing $1 billion a year just by selling photocopiers. So to give you a, a sense of just how important of an invention it was and how widespread its use became so incredibly quickly, this chart shows you how quickly this company grew. In fact, by 1980, they're doing $8 billion a year, and now they only have 60% uh, of the market share. So now it tells you like the Koreans have kind of gotten involved. They're now selling market, uh, photocopiers as well. So they've grown bigger, but there's actually the market's even larger than you've seen. And my point here is that the entire existence of Access Information Acts is entirely predicated on the existence of a type of technology. So it's not necessarily Nixon that was necessary. It was the combination of Nixon and the technology and the public outcry. And so this graph becomes the one that I think is one that's very interesting to groups like yours and the people that I spend time with, which is there's some form of public demand for change that combines with some form of organization that can marshal and focus that demand that combines with maybe a new form of technology that, that creates new senses of opportunity around what can be done. And it's that secret spot in the middle where this organization and organizations like it tend to sit. And what I really love is everybody in this room is an incredible strategic thinker because when I look at the Gov website, this is the Venn diagram that I always see. So you already intuitively understand that you are a social movement that is trying to build capital to force organizations to change and that you are trying to combine these three forms of capital together to do something interesting. So you should all actually just applaud yourselves very quickly right now because you have actually, I think, understood something that is very important. 
And so the question we want to ask ourselves as people who are in this space is, how do we increase the size of that sweet spot? What do we do to make it better? And so one thing we can do is we could try to increase public demand. This is very, very hard to do, but if you do that, you know, that sweet spot gets bigger. But the other thing that I think is actually much, much more in our control is how do we increase the effectiveness of us, of us as an organizing group, as a, as a kind of a coalition of people who are working together. And I want to kind of spend the rest of my time thinking about that. So I have three thoughts that I want to talk about. The first is I want to talk about what our goals are. The second, I want to talk about what it means to be part of a big tent. And the third is I want to talk about power. So I do a lot of work um, with nonprofits in other spaces, especially in the environmental movement around the world. And they have very, very sophisticated notions about how they are going to achieve change. Um, and this is a very common model. So the first thing we do is someone says, there's some form of change that we want. They do some form of analysis of what that change is going to look like. They have a theory of if we take these actions, we are going to force people to change. Um, they develop a campaign that is going to make those actions into reality. And then they implement that campaign. And then in theory, big change happens. So if you work for Greenpeace, uh, you don't like an oil company and the work that they're doing. You analyze where their weak spots are. Maybe you assess that their brand is the thing you want to attack. You have a theory of change now that if we attack their brand, they will then capitulate and stop doing what they're doing. And then we develop a campaign to hurt their brand. We go out and we hurt their brand as badly as we possibly can. We protest, we put big signs, we make a mess. And then in theory, they back down and we get the change that we want. And this is, what a kind of, this is actually what a Greenpeace uh, campaign chart looks like. There's an incredible amount of work and negotiations that's going on all around this entire theory. And I show this to you because I want you to be asking yourselves, what are we doing? And very often in the government space, what I feel I see happening is there is that kind of moment that makes you angry, that makes you say, I want to make something change. I, I see an ad or something that makes me angry. And then we skip all of the other stuff that's in between there and we go straight to implementation. We're like, yes, I know exactly what I want to do. I want to build an app or a web page that is going to uh, expose that. I'm going to go stri straight to implementation. And then we kind of hope for big change. And what I want to really encourage people in this room to do is to think a lot more about what is your theory of change? What are you actually trying to do? What is the leverage that you think you are going to gain over a government by doing the actions that you are taking? And more importantly, what is your goal? Is your goal to change the government? Is your goal to uh, make a better website so the public can access something more easily? Is your goal just to have fun? Right? These are all valid goals, but I want you to at least be thinking about what is your goal and to get aligned around them. And more importantly, I want you to be thinking about shifting goals. I've seen too many people in social movements where initially the goal is one thing, but partway through, the goal suddenly becomes something else. So a great example of this um, is very common, and I am also guilty of this, is that you maybe you have a goal of you want to change government. So uh, in my case, I, the thing I had to be really careful of is I wanted my government to do open data. So I built a website, and the whole purpose of the website was to expose the government and show them that they were being silly by not doing open data. And the real risk for me is that the goal of my project would shift from changing government to just embarrassing government. The goal was never to only embarrass government. Embarrassing government was simply the means by which to achieve the actual goal, which was change. And yet, very often, I see people get actually, they kind of lose sight. And the making government get embarrassed becomes the goal. Because it's fun, and more importantly, it's seductive because it increases public demand. And so I'm not in any way saying that should not be something you do. I'm only saying make sure it's in service of the actual goal that you have. So are you trying to change government or are you trying to embarrass government? Which one are you trying to do? Always be, and these aren't the only two choices. There's a thousand other choices out there. Always be coming back. What actually is the goal I have? The second is, is the people in this room make up, you are a big tent coalition. Or if you're not already, you're soon going to be. And when I look at you, you know, who are the people who are showing up? You, obviously, you have software programmers and developers, but you probably also start to have other civil society members like environmentalists. Um, there's probably some entrepreneurs in the room who are thinking about, well, I'd like to offer a service that makes government better. Um, librarians, journalists, bloggers, CIOs, um, public servants. Um, all of these people are in your tent. 
And I think one of the critical things is when you have a big tent, you want to acknowledge the different motivations that people have. Not everybody is here to do the exact same thing that you are trying to do. And the real risk, the real risk around this is to start judging other people as not being worthy because they do not share the same goals as you. So I experience this all the time. So you've got a big tent, you've got journalists. The journalists want to make the government pay for mistakes. You've got the entrepreneurs. They want to help government. They don't want to punish government. They're like, I want to be serving government. Uh, sometimes you have some open government activists who are like, yeah, we want to make services better. And then you have environmentalists who are like, we want to stop that problem over there. It is, it is great that you have a diversity of goals. The main thing is, can you acknowledge those different goals and first negotiate among one another to figure out what is the shared goal of this group and how are we going to work in harmony to achieve what we all want to achieve in a way that allows us to also go out and achieve separate and distinct goals that we all have. And uh, you know, I, really, I, see that I do some work with the Presidential Innovation Fellows at the White House, and uh, the people who become Presidential Innovation Fellows, I'm really, like, I've now distilled out, uh, thanks to one of the fellows, there's really three types. There's the patriots, there's the careerists, and there's the evangelists. And they all come with, they're all, they're all doing the same thing, they have an amazing job, but the patriots are there because they love their country. And anybody who's here who does, who's not here because they don't love their country, they're not worthy of being a fellow. And the careers are like, I had a kind of okay job, and having this job means I'm going to have a great job next. And they're like, if you screw my project up, you're screwing up the ability for us to do amazing things in the future, so don't screw my project up. And the evangelists are like, I don't care about the projects. I'm not even sure I care about my country. We better be doing open source. So they're like the evangelists, right? And they have a mission to drive something into the organization. And you get these people in the room together, and they actually have a lot of shared goals. But it's very easy for one to judge the other and for them to be, start to have unnecessary friction because they simply don't agree why the other one is here. Forget about what they can accomplish. So I want everybody here to have open and honest conversations about why you're here, what you're trying to accomplish, and help build a common vision and common goals. The other big problem of a big tent is I think they're very hard to sustain, and that's an okay thing. The analogy I always like to make with the open government movement is with the open source movement. You know, 15 years ago, I think that the kind of conferences like OzCon were a really, really important conference because if you, if you liked open source software, if you believed in open source software, you were at the margins of any community that you were in. Like people were kind of like, that's kind of weird, that open source stuff, I'm not so sure about that. And OzCon was suddenly this place where you found all these people who loved and believed the same things that you did. And now, you know, I still think those conferences are important, but they're not nearly as important as they used to be because now there's like DrupalCon, there's DjangoCon, there's like all of these open source conferences that are much more niche and, fo and focused. And so I think your job here is not just to be part of a big tent, but it's to take the ideas and the knowledge of this movement and of, of what this group of people want to do and go and infect the community that you originally came from. So if you're a journalist, go back and infect other journalists with the great virus that we have. If you are a software developer, go back and infect the software development community with the great virus that is here. So you're not just here doing your job here. You're actually an agent of change back in the community in which you came from. And that is like when a big tent is successful, it doesn't matter when it collapses because it's infected so many other communities that the ideas all live there as well. And then the final point I want to leave with you all is kind of a little bit of a cautionary tale um, around power. I think it's very dangerous for us to assume that there's not power at work here. Um, you guys are trying to build power. You're trying to build power to affect change on organizations. Some of those organizations are government. That requires a lot of power. Governments have power. They're trying to use that to affect change on you, to have you not do certain things, to have you do certain things. And you need to be asking yourselves, what happens when you use that power? And more, more importantly, what happens when you're effective with that power? Um, you know, for a lot of people in the kind of open data space, I think uh, there's a belief that if, if the more open data you have, the more the world's going to become better and better and better. And, and kind of like the superficial version of this is like the, the flu trends graph, which shows you like if we just have more data, we can predict when people are going to get sick and see the world's a better place because now we can predict when people are going to get sick. 
And, and I feel this on a personal level. This is what I think is a much more realistic level. Um, I work with environmentalists and loggers. I'm trying to figure out how to limit the damaging impact of logging. And so here you see there's an environmentalist. These are loggers. And they're all looking at maps that are actually filled with open data. It's totally amazing. They're using maps filled with open data to help them figure out where are the places that really cannot be logged and what are the places that maybe can, and try to bring harmony to these two groups that are normally very much in conflict. But I'm not sure that this is always the narrative that's going to happen. And I, we have a responsibility to make sure we understand that and that we fight other narratives. And my favorite example is this chart here. This is a congressional district in Chicago. It might look like it is oddly shaped. You might not naturally say this is how one would design a congressional district. Some people would even say this district is a mistake. I would actually argue this district is actually a perfect success. It is a perfect success if you have the goal of wanting to determine what the outcome in that district is going to be. And the only way that you can do this is if you have public census data. And you use that data and you have a pretty good idea about where the Democrats live and where the Republicans live and therefore you can draw a map that circulates all of the Republicans and groups them kindly with just enough Democrats so the Republicans will conveniently win. Or vice versa. This is all only made possible with great data. My point here is that the data is political. What you are doing, even if you think you are purely in the technology space, it is a deeply political thing that you are trying to do here. And you want to be thinking about what that means all the time. In my own country, like my own country, we've struggled with this. The, um, I'm Canadian. Um, we have a census as well. And we used to have something called uh, the long form part of the census, which was uh, the part that only a small percentage of the population filled out, but it gave you much more detailed um, assessment of what was going on. And our government turned around and made that entirely voluntary. And as a result, once the data is voluntary, it kind of, anyone here who does any data knows immediately that basically all the results don't really mean anything at all anymore, and it's all basically a complete waste of time. Um, the shocking thing is they spent more money to do that than they would have just forcing the 20% of people to write the survey, but let's not explore that. The point that I want to make is what you now see is in a world where the data is becoming political, politicians are going to care a lot more about the types of data that they make available. If I now know that what I collect is going to be made available to the public, I'm going to be a lot more concerned about what I collect. And if I can't control what I collect, I might just force people to use very specific types of data. And this is my favorite example. Uh, this is down in North Carolina, where the government, the, the state level government, now says that all urban planning can only use linear projections of sea level rises because they don't believe in global warming. So as a result, if you live in a city in North Carolina, you are by law required to only do planning to assume that sea levels are going to rise in a linear way and not in a more accelerated pace. And the result of that means that basically if you live on a beach in North Carolina, it's going to become harder and harder for you to get insurance. And in fact, it's going to be harder and harder to do insurance anywhere in North Carolina, at least housing insurance, because no one's going to actually know uh, whether the city planning has taken into account the fact that sea levels are probably going to rise. And so here we understand the data will be political, and so we're making political choices and forcing people on how to use it. You people in this room have a special ability to understand the implications of this, much, much more so than many other people. And you have a responsibility to expose and to think and be critical, not only about what others are doing, but what about you are doing yourself um, to ensure that your movement is doing things that actually serve the public and don't always just serve the wrong people. I'm going to stop there for now. I'd love to do some questions, and I'll do a session tomorrow. Um, thank you again so much for having me. Do you want to do questions, or do we not have time? That's okay. Ah, because of time constraints, we open the stage for a question, okay? We'll take one question uh, from the crowd. Anyone? I scared them too much. It's terrible. <laughs> 可能大家都还在从惊吓中恢复。啊<笑>、uh, ，前面可以按。对。我是一个非常老的媒体人。所以，我在这边可能是平均年龄要再乘以二、乘以三。所以，我想问的是，当刚谈到了说要了解科。
可能在从事一些改变的过程中的不同人的不同动机。那么，请问跨世代的了解跟跨世代的和解，或是和谐跟共同的努力该怎么创造？这个是由年轻的世代发起，还是老的世代发起，还是有没有更好的策略？呀、yeah. ，So I think there's like a real this this is a great question, and I strike strikes the heart of like this is the skill set that I actually believe is enormously important in movement building, is that you have to find ways to create connections between people, and so I think the hard part is there's no simple answer to that question. There's no this is the one way that you're going to do it, but and, and in fact one of the simple things I love that slide you had up of the safe space. Like that's that's like that's the entry level stakes on how to start having this conversation, which is how do we create a safe space for the people who are in the room? But then I think this, the next question is is what are the skills? And, and I'm biased here. I'm a negotiation expert, so I see negotiations everywhere I go. You know, so I have a hammer. I see a lot of nails. Um, but uh, you know, my my question to you is how do you guys actually first acknowledge? Like, can you identify with the different groups? Even just applying labels, like the fact that I can say I'm a public policy entrepreneur. Um, these are the things that I care about, and that's actually quite distinct from a, a journalist who wants to create problems and expose the government doing wrong. I, that's actually a very important starting point to acknowledge. Just simply acknowledging those differences is a prerequisite to trying to figure out ways where we can work together, and then understanding the places where we actually have just fundamentally different views, and we can't work together. So that for me is actually having those conversations. And I think often people are scared to talk about the motivations of different parties and the perceived. Motivations of those parties, and so I think having those really creating a safe place to have those really explicit conversations is, is the the mo that's the prerequisite, the most important thing you can do, and then building the skill to having those conversations as an individual also enormously important. How? 那我们感谢 David。那他明天在 on conference， 他因为他其实是一个谈判专家，所以他会做一个 session 让大家了解谈判跟这个沟通跟协作之间的关系，然后也会带大家经过一些练习。所以有来参加 on conference， 千万不要错过。那我们再一次感谢 David。呃，那各位表定上的议程是九点五十分，在各个呃不同的会议室。好，那我们因为时间的关系，我们晚十分钟开始，会在十点开始。那我们当然也是晚十分钟结束。好，那呃就请大家呃看呃，我们手上其实大家应该都有，然后议程它在折页的中间，就是每一个会啊、呃，它上面好像没有写每一个会议室，不好意思啊、哦。那所以呃，在呃会议室的门口其实都有贴出来说这个议程是在哪一边。好，那我们的呃。各位的右手边，呃，是国呃国会呃开放国会这个议程，然后左手边第二会议室是,是呃呃教教育教育部词典跟呃相关字典的议程。好，那就大家待会见，谢谢。